Hello there. I want to deal with this question. Maybe the question the questioner asks, maybe you have any proof that Muslims 200 to a thousand years before today never performed the five times prayer. Now, I need to answer this question um, by delving into a topic called hermeneutics. Um, hermeneutics is the science of interpreting words. Um, and it's an important science for us as students of the Quran, because I mean, after all, there's a verse in the Quran that makes this claim or that question that, that makes this statement. Um, chapter 4, verse 46, it says, مِنَ الَّذِينَ هَادُوا يُحَرِّفُونَ الْكَلِمَ عَنْ مَوَادِعِهِ وَيَقُولُونَ سَمِعْنَا وَعَصَيْنَا Those include Jews who shift the meaning of the words, then state, we heard, but we reject. So this idea of shifting the meaning of the words makes the Quran or any religious text fall squarely within the ambit of hermeneutic studies. And we need to make sure that our reading of the words, that our reading of the, that our understanding of the words or our reading of the words is faithful to the intended meaning of the writer. And that is really what we want to talk about um, in dealing with this question. Because I'm going to answer this question by referring back to the concept, the idea of Salat. Now, Salat in the Quran, you see, first of all, let us dispel, because I think the prejudice that most of people who are students of the Quran and if you're watching this, you see, if, if, you, if you feel yourself to be an authority <clears throat> on the Quran, if you feel that everything that is to be known about the Quran is already known, and people have nothing more to learn, then I think you need to change channel. Go and watch something else. Go and watch Mufti Mink or somebody who feels that the Quran is done and dusted. We, we understand everything and we have no further need for modern day or for few for further research. <coughs> Our position here is that the study of the Quran is an ongoing process. It is an ongoing process of renewal. It is an ongoing process of discovery. And if you're telling me that all the meaning in the Quran has been discovered back in the year 1200, then I think that arrogance is, is of somebody who is unwilling and unfit to draw and benefit more from this book. So, first of all, let me first start by saying, as students of the Quran, we have the departure point that nobody is a master in the Quran. Nobody is a, yes, you can be a master in memorizing the Quran, but nobody is a master in the meaning of the Quran, at least nobody that's alive at present. So, we are all students of the Quran and we are applying the best tools at our disposal to understand the Quran. And those are the people that I'm dealing with. I hope that those are the people that are watching this. So coming back to the question of the five salahs, you see the, the word salat is, is, a, is a contested concept. It is a concept, the meaning of the word is contested. The thesis that I advance on this channel and many many similar Arabic scholars and non-Arabic scholars and, Ar and African and even European and even some American scholars and I know of a Hungarian scholar you know so many or Romanian there are so many scholars that are really looking at the hermeneutics of the Quran and the word Salah falls in that category now how do I how do I try to convince you or persuade you I can't persuade you of what the meaning of the word is that you have to make a study of the word in its various 
locations in the Quran. But I can show you something else. I can show you that words do shift over time, naturally. Because human society changes. Our lifestyles, our practices, our technology, um, our habits, they change over time. And we, we tend to alter the meaning of words to fit new um, technology. Like, for example, the word computer. A computer is, is, a, is a new word, but it comes from an ancient word or an old word that is compute, to figure out or to make sense or to, to, to get the answer, compute. So I want to show you a few examples of words that you might not have expected that have changed over the years. And let me, let me show you. If I had to tell you, <laughs> let me take an example of the word spinning. If I tell you, define the word spinning, right? You, you would say spinning, it's some way of catching fish. It's a way of, of fishing. Uh, you have a line, you cast it, and you uh, draw the line back, and you, you know, it's a, it's a means of, of fishing, especially in rivers and so on. Right? That's one form of spinning. Somebody else will say, no, spinning is something you do in a gym. It's a type of workout. <laughs> so if I tell you that spinning is a very common practice 100 years ago or 200 years ago, which involves a thread, then you would might be surprised if you're a youngish person. Um, but that's exactly what it is. If you look at the definition of the word spinning, then it says that spinning is the process of making fibrous material into yarn or thread, the act of fishing, the act of... So as you can see, the word spinning. Uh, if I had to do the same question, if I had to ask you the same question to define the word driving, Define the word driving, 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 right? Driving a car. You would be, it, it is interesting that that word does not exist in the 1800s before the invention of motorized vehicles. The word driving means completely something else. And then you would look at transmitting power, motion, violent, intense, or forceful, energetic, or active. You see, so... So the word driving, for example, also, let's take the word shopping. If, if you look at the word shopping, that word does not exist in ancient times. Now, shopping is a phenomenon, it's a, mod, it's, a, it's a phenomenon of modern society. So let me then give you another one. And I want to give you the word caravan, a caravan. Now, if you're living in, in the UK or South Africa, or Australia, you will know what a caravan is. I think in America they call it a trailer. Uh, now, a trailer, a caravan or a trailer, is a mobile sort of home on wheels, a portable place to stay on wheels. That's a caravan. But if you asked an Arab in the year 800 what's a caravan, they would see, obviously understand a caravan as a as a long sequence of camels, as a as a as a, a sequence of ten thousand camels, and that's how big those caravans were. And let me take one more. The word traffic. I ask you, what does the word traffic mean? Now, the old meaning of the word traffic is simply to convey um, cargo, right? To convey cargo, to to transfer or to ship cargo from one point to another. However, if I ask you now, it is traffic in, 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 your, in our modern times, you're going to tell me it's all the cars on the road that's causing congestion and that makes it difficult to drive. So, you know, uh, let me take an old word that doesn't exist anymore. Let me take the word snuff. Snuff. Now, snuffing is something that was practiced also 60, 70 years ago, which is just the the breathing in or the almost like in um, ingesting of, uh, of, of, of a tobacco powder. And um, so it's also something, if I told you snuff, 
you you would you wouldn't really know what it is and so we what I, the point i'm trying to make is that over time words change their meanings now you're going to tell me yeah, but anwar the quran is not like english the quran has never undergone a change in meaning that, that's why i want to correct you you see the the quran is eternal the words of the quran are not subject to alteration the the script the text the 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 actual letter lettering or the letters are not subject to change but as i've shown you here that um it is possible for people to um to 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 mess around with the meaning who shifted the meaning of the words min alladhina hadu yuharrifuna kalima al mawadi'i so it is possible for people to shift the meaning and that is the thesis that i'm advancing here is that people have shifted the meaning now how do you shift the meaning let, let, let me let me take an example very very common present example how powerful people can change meaning of words this is this is something that you you will not be able to deny it once you hear it you see the oxford dictionary defines a vaccine as something as a, a a medical intervention that will prevent the recipient from contracting a or at least um make it highly almost impossible for the recipient of that vaccine to contract a particular disease or disorder or sickness right that was the traditional definition of a vaccine in the year 2021 the oxford dictionary authorities and uh, here it is and this is an msn right so this is not a this is not a conspiracy site this is a mainstream site microsoft msn and the question is the question is did the center for disease control now this is a, a state of associated or affiliated body right this is something that belongs to the powerful to the ruling class to the ruling powers did the center for disease control and Preven Pre prevention cdc change its definition of vaccine the answer yes the cdc the cdc changed its definition of vaccine from a product that stimulates a person's immune system to produce immunity a product that stimulates a person's immune system to produce immunity to a specific di disease protecting the person from that disease to a preparation that is used to stimulate the body's immune response so as you can see a radical difference you see and we know for a fact that vaccines was were always something that prevent you from getting smallpox or measles or polio so if you have the vaccine you feel you won't get those things but um the meaning has been changed so for our purposes in this discussion i want to make the point here for you that powerful the authorities those who are in control of the of the levers of power and cdc when they change the definition oxford dictionary and cambridge dictionary and whatever other dictionaries they have to comply and change their definitions so it is possible for a small number of people that are at the command under the command of the central elite and if you in this day and age don't believe that there's a central elite then i think you <laughs> you you uh, i think you you haven't been living on planet earth for the past 10 years so the central elite which in our times has been more centralized than any time in history can change the meaning of a word now do you really think that the powerful elite of 60 years after the prophet the powerful elite that lived 60 years after the prophet um you know could not have the same powers believe me they had the same powers the control the rule 
was centralized. There was a king in the capital of the Muslim world. That king was called the Caliph. In the year 61, after the son, the grandson of the Prophet was massacred along with most of the family of the Prophet at a place called Karbala, those kings were completely detached from any further direct connection to the ideas of the Prophet. The school of the Prophet, the community of scholarship, the children, those who were closest to the Prophet, were eliminated in 61, with the exception of one or two small children who continued to become very, who were very private, you know, individuals and did their research privately. Do you really think those powerful elite rulers would not mess around with the ideas of the Quran? I mean, they were able, they were willing to massacre the children, the grandchildren of the Prophet. Yes, they did it. Yes, they did it. The evidence is there. We know now that they paid off people to lie for them. They paid off people to misinterpret the words of the Quran. And yes, you still, you Salafi still want to believe. No, but that is the best. The, the Salaf was Salih, the best generation that ever lived. That's a lie you tell yourself. There's no basis for that in the Quran. In fact, the Quran says the very opposite, that they follow the ways of their fathers. There is no proof. You see, let me ask you something here. Do you believe, if you believe the Sahaba could not tell lies, do you believe that same position about the Sahaba of Isa, or the Sahaba of Musa, or the Sahaba of Nuh? Do you believe the same about those Sahaba? Because, I mean, Sahaba, those who, comp who, who associate with the Prophet, who are his companions, they are not immune from cor corruption. And the, the loaded, the, the point, I think, in this question is, maybe I have any proof that Muslims 200 to 1,000 years before today never performed the five times prayer. You see, if I, if I have to turn that question around and say that, um, do you believe that 1,000 years ago uh, Muslims... Um, a, uh, a, a 1.8 billion Muslims would be conquered by uh, 10 or 15 million Jews. You know, 1.8 billion Muslims would be conquered by 15 million Jews in their own heartland. If I told you that a thousand years ago, you'd say it's preposterous, it's unthinkable, it's, it's, there's no way that that could happen, it's impossible. So, you see, the, the, the fact that we are analyzing history with our present understanding is called the crime of presentism. The crime of presentism is when you, when you suppose history to be like the present. When you suppose the time 50 years after the Prophet to be like the present. Now I want you to picture an army of 4,000 Muslims attacking a group of 85 family members of the Prophet and massacring them, massacring them and um, dismembering their bodies. You see, as unthinkable as that act is, so unthinkable is the thought that we have changed and corrupted the very ritual practices of Islam. And the, and the proof, the proof of all of this is the Quran. Because the only book that has remained unchanged over those 1,450 years is the Quran. Everything else have either not been around at that time, because the first Hadith book, Bukhari, was only written 200 years later. 200. The first Shafi Madhab only wrote his Kitab salat You know, Kitab salat how to make Salat. He only wrote that 300 years later. So, Kitabu Salat, uh, Malik bin Anas, the Maliki Mazhab, he only wrote the Muwatta, and the Muwatta does not contain how to make Salah, believe me. The Muwatta is a very condensed book. Um, it only appears about 150 years after the Prophet, after the Hijrah. So, we cannot 
make the assumption that the Salah that we have is necessarily the same Salah that the Prophet had. And the proof is the Quran. Because in the Quran, it spells out how to do your will and testament. It spells out how to wash when you go to the bathroom, the, 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 the ablution, how to wash yourself. It spells out um, who you can marry. It spells out the rules of warfare. It, it spells out a number of rituals, but it omits completely. It omits completely any detail. Now, you're telling me Islam wasn't complete for 250 years before. And, you know, the other thing is that the salah that we make, like that, that because that is the question, any any proof that Muslims 200 years to 1,000 years never perform the five times. You see, if I look at the salah that we are used to, right, uh, all the thousands of rules associated with it, there is no hadith. People say, yeah, but that's in the hadith. There is no hadith. I have studied a Shafi'i book, which a lot of the intelligentsia are, are Shafi'is in the Muslim world. Right? The, the scholars in, in Egypt, I think majority of Egypt, uh, the, the, the professors at the University of, 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 of Al-Azhar Al Al are Shafi'i. Now, I have Kitab al um, right? I think it's a 20-volume set. And I've read the book, and I've not read the whole book, but I've, I've, I've read in the book, I've read about, I've read passages of the book. And I, I didn't come one day and wake up and say the Salah that we are experiencing is different from the original Salah. You see, I went to the chapter on Salah in Kitab al um. You are welcome to do the same. And in Kitab al-Um, which is the comp compilation of the new school of Imam Shafi'i, of the Shafi'i, um, founder of the Shafi'i uh, uh, school of thought, who sets out the process and the method and the way to make Salah. I read that section on Salah, Kitab al-Salah, and I, I, I studied every action. Now, if you're telling me the salah is you have to raise your hands and then do this and do it. There is no single hadith or even a multiplicity of hadiths that could be assembled to give the salah. It's almost like there are 20 hadiths on the topic and the rest they fill in. You see, so they, they the scholars like the the fiqh scholars like Shafi'i and, 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 and the scholars of, because the product that you are dealing with is not the product of Shafi'i, it's the product of the scholars of, of Shafi'i, like um, Nan, uh, Nawaw, Nawawi. And these are scholars of scholars, so the students of Shafi'i. Uh, the same with Hanafi. Abu Hanifa didn't write a detailed book in fiqh. He had scholars, um, Shaybani and other scholars that actually filled in the blanks. The same with the Shia. You see, the Shia scholars, there's no book. You can't find, I have the Musnad of Imam Zayyid here. There's no, there's no detailed, I've read the Shia hadith books, there's no detailed hadith on Salah. So what you are relying on is that people have filled in the blanks, scholars, so-called scholars, and they've produced for you a package called Salah. And this package is sold to you as ancient and as original and as authentic. But I'm here to tell you that the only criterion to judge what is authentic and original is the Quran. Because it is the oldest book. It is the oldest book. And we can, in fact, go to the Bible also. Because the Bible and the Torah are also ancient books preceding the Quran and not... not you can tell me now, yeah, but we don't touch the Bible, the Bible. No, you can touch the Bible. The Quran says the same Bible that we have here is the same Bible that the Prophet in his lifetime, the same Torah that he referred to. The Torah didn't change in 1400, my friend. Please, do not don't do not tell yourself stories so that you could escape accountability. If you lie to yourself, you will not 
um, escape accountability. So the Torah that the prophet knew about does not provide any details about the Salah. And this Salah, we are told, is the same Salah that Nuh, sorry, that Musa and Ibrahim and uh, Zachariah and all these previous great holy men undertook or performed. So why is there no details in their books? There's no details in the Torah. There's no details in the in Jill. If you, even if you want to take the New Testament as a corruption or a a, a, a sort of a weak or incomplete or imperfect uh, transmission of the Injil. Why does it not there even contain any details? You see, and yes, I know there's a verse that says Jesus fell on his neck, head and brought out. Yes, but that, that's, not, that's not details. That's not Salah in its minuscule details that we do. So it's absent from the ancient books and the Quran, in fact, asks us to refer to those books also. It's not in the, in the Torah. It's not in the Injil whatever version we want to consider the Injil, it's not in the Quran, it's not in any written text of the first 200 years. And so all I can say is that there is no basis, there is no connection with the word Salah to the original practice of the Prophet. Now, yes, let me, let me hasten to add, the word Salah, is a is a is a noun that is drawn from a verb. The verb is salla or sal sot lam ya. Now there's there's a lot of Arabic words that are just turned into a noun by just extending the final like rida or um, shifa. So shifa means health, good health. Rida means being satisfied with, right? Radiallahu an Rida. So the word Rida or Shifa are abstract nouns. They don't refer to a hardcore practice. They, they refer to the general state of satisfaction, Rida. Or Shifa, a general state of good health. Now Salah, Salah, is similarly refers to a general state of being connected, being involved, being engaged. And if you really look at a modern um, expression of the term, then you can use the word law abidingness, right? Law abiding or, or being engaged or being aligned to the law. So that is the word. The word salah simply means to be lawful, to be, to, to step in line. And you know what? <laughs> if you look at the practice of salah, the forming of safa, saf, uh, sufu, safs, it's a, it's, a, it's a literalization of a abstract word. You see, if you line up, you're creating a system, an ordered system. And it's beautiful, but people have actually invented a ritual, you know, standing in a, in a matrix, you know, in a, in a structured form, in rows and in columns, and facing to the same direction and reciting and doing things in harmony. Yes, that is a, a physical um, literalization of a, an abstract concept called being aligned or an order now i've got no problem i go to the mosque and i make salah because it is a symbolic form of salah salah is a much wider term it means a social order when you go to the to the masjid or you with your friends and you form a salah a, a physical um, mechanical salah you are creating a a, a symbolic salah but you cannot reduce real Salah to its symbolic expression. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when the Prophet called people to Salah, and there are proof or, or a verse in the Quran that shows that people were called to Salah. They were summoned 
to Salah. So there was an actual physical Salah also. So people would be called and then the Prophet would, uh, you know, there's for example Surat Jumu'ah. Ya ayyuhal ladheena, a'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu idha nudiya li salatim yawmil Jumu'ah. If you are summoned, if you are summoned to attend Salah, so there is a, a physical, literal Salah, which you are, can be summoned to, because obviously you can't be summoned to something abstract. Right? So on that, on that busy day, on the day when you are busy, Yawmil Jumu'at, on, on the day when people are con, um, gathering um, and you are, you are invited or summoned to Salah, then you should attend, then you should go and in, you know, attend with the nesir, with eagerness. Attend at Salah with eagerness. So I want to explain to you that the idea of Salah, yes, there's a physical expression, and but more importantly, it's an abstract concept that means the social order. Now, the five times, I think maybe, you see, the, the Prophet's Salah was not counting rakats and counting. Um, no, the essential ingredients of the Salah were the recital of the Quran, the attention that people gave, the focusing on the meaning of the words, the, the, in, the taking of instructions, and then the, any additional information regarding the community. And that was the point of gathering. The point of gathering was to undergo a personal transformation in terms of your knowledge, and then that knowledge will transform your behavior or your practice. And that is the point of ritual salah. It is to engender or to institute an ongoing familiarity with the law or with the, with the book, with a code, which will affect your practice in the real world. So what we are doing here, what you are doing now, in fact, listening or hearing a verse from the Quran, this is a form of becoming acquainted with the salah. But you see... That is what those groups of people were doing when they were summoned to Salah. But we should never forget that the majority of the cases where the Quran speaks about Salah, it speaks about Salah in a in an abstract way. In an abstract way, you see. And that is what people can't fathom. It's very difficult for them to fathom that. You see, it's almost like if I tell you exercise is good for you, and you associate exercise with going to the gym uh, one day or with taking a walk around the block for 20 minutes. You see, yes, that is exercise, but that is not the concept exercise. Walking around the block is exercise, but it doesn't constitute the concept of exercise. The same with Salah. To, to go and attend a session at the mosque or in your home where you hear the Quran and you reflect on the Quran and you make tokens or s of devotion to the Almighty, to the Creator. That's, that is a particular expression of Salah, but that does not replace the concept of Salah, which is a concept of order, of general alignment with the, with the law of God. In fact, we are supposed to establish Salah, which means we are supposed to establish the social order as envisaged in the Quran. That is the point of establishing Salah. Now, if you, if you are Muawiyah and you are Yazid and any other corrupt ruler that ruled the Muslim world, and people tell you that, listen, Salah means to institute the way of the Quran and the way of the of, of the text, the code, but yet you are busy killing people, robbing them, plundering, stealing the, from the fiscus, um, lying, cheating, um, womanizing, um, drinking. You are doing every conceivable evil. And people tell you Salah means to abide by the law. What are you going to do? You're going to say, no, that's not what Salah is. You're going to tell all your paid scholars for dollars that that is I don't want to hear that in the Juma khutbah. What you're going to preach is that Salah is going up and down up and down, up and down and 
reciting things that people don't actually listen to. That is how they have vulgarized the idea of Salah. Because it doesn't fit them. If you tell the kings now of the Arab world that Salah means instituting the, the righteous way of the book, the code, they will tell you, no, you're mad. That is not Salah. Because they don't want that type of Salah. They want the Salah that is a mindless ritual. Now, I'm not speaking from my neck here. I'm not making these things up. I'm bringing you back to the original ideas. And maybe you can ponder, but um, rather than asking what is the proof that people didn't make five times, you should ask what is the proof that people did make. And in, 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 in historiography, we... we um, or Easter, what is the word, um, in, in the study of history, we don't look at evidence for not having something. We've got evidence to establish the practice. And surely, um, if I look at the fiqh books written 200 years later, if I look at even the hadith books, the practice is not shown in there, you see. And um, all we are left with is bits and pieces that, that could be part of it, but... I'll, I'll come way afterwards.